Welcome to the CHCI Tech Summit panel, A Healthy Digital Life. This session is possible due to the gracious contributions from our sponsors, Apple, Dropbox, and the Entertainment Software Association. Our moderator for today's session is Jens Manuel Krogstad, a senior writer and editor at Pew Research Center. He has authored or edited hundreds of studies on topics that include global migration, Latino public opinion, Hispanic demographic trends, and U.S. border enforcement. Please welcome Jens Manuel Krogstad. Good afternoon. My name is Jens Manuel Krogstad, and I am looking forward to moderating today's panel on a healthy digital life. Before we start our session, I'd like to thank CHCI for creating an online space for dialogue and engagement on important issues impacting the Latino community. Uh, and before we dive into the introduction of the panel of experts, I wanted to uh, lay the groundwork, offer some context about this issue, about this issue based on uh, some recent uh, reports and research that we published at the Pew Research Center. Uh, COVID-19 has uh, highlighted the central role the internet plays in the lives of Americans of all ages, educational levels, and racial and ethnic backgrounds. Uh, this spring, we found more than three quarters of Americans said losing internet or cell phone service during the outbreak would be a big problem for their daily life. So really, digital life has uh, become uh, real life uh, for Americans, for many Americans during the pandemic. Uh, and it's important to note that there are differences in how different Americans access the internet. Overall, more Americans have a smartphone than home uh, broadband, and there are some differences by race and ethnicity. Black and Hispanic Americans, notably, are more likely to have a smartphone than home broadband. And this is also true for those with a uh, high school education or less, and those with incomes of less than $30,000. Uh, about six in 10 parents with lower incomes say it's likely their children, uh, when they're learning remotely at home, would face at least one digital obstacle to doing their work. Uh, some of these obstacles include doing schoolwork on a cell phone, using public Wi-Fi, or, or not finishing their schoolwork uh, due to a lack of a computer at home. Uh, but, but even before COVID-19, many school-aged children faced a quote-unquote digital homework gap. One in four Black and Hispanic households with school-aged children didn't have a high-speed internet connection. Uh, and parents have some concerns about uh, their children and uh, screen time. 71% said they're concerned that their child might spend too much time in front of screens. 61% uh, of parents have sought advice from doctors or other medical professionals about screen time. So this is really a major area of concern uh, for parents. Uh, and, and parents tell us that YouTube plays a central role in the life in the digital life of children. 80% of parents of young children say their child watches videos on YouTube. Um, and even amongst all these concerns, parents themselves struggle with uh, screen time. 68% of parents say they at least sometimes feel distracted by their phone when spending time with their kids. And uh, as a parent of a two-year-old daughter, I certainly identify with that. I think we all struggle balancing our digital life and our home and family life, even more so now during the pandemic. Um, and before we dive in, oh, we've, I want to make sure we note that uh, we want to hear from you, our audience. Um, so please place your comments and questions in the chat. Uh, you can also continue the conversation on social media at hashtag CHCI Summit. And with all that said, uh, let's introduce our panel of experts. Uh, I'll, I'll ask each of you to briefly explain the interests you have in this issue. And if you could keep those responses to about a minute or two, that'll allow us to address some, some of the more specific questions we'll, we'll have. Uh, and um, one last note, uh, Representative Traham will have to leave at about 1 p.m. Uh, before the Q&A due to a prior commitment. So um, with that, let's start with Representative Traham. Uh, could you uh, please uh, tell us briefly about what brings you to this issue? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me uh, to join all of you today. I especially want to thank uh, Jens, my fellow panelists, and those at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute who worked tirelessly to put us uh, together and have this annual event, especially right now during these unprecedented times. You know, as a member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, I am deeply appreciative of the role that CHCI plays in developing the next generation of Latinx leaders. You know, last winter I had the pleasure of hosting a CHCI intern 
Glendy Alvarez in my Washington office. And she took such pride in her work uh, for the program. And she offered uh, unbelievable skills uh, and unique life experiences, assets that added tremendous value to the culture of our office and, uh, and the services that we offer. Uh, to answer your question or to, to give you a, a sense of why I'm, uh, I'm here today, over the past year, the coronavirus pandemic has altered life as we know it. Uh, in an effort to keep students and families, educators uh, safe, more than 50 million American students transitioned from classrooms to online le learning, including my own. Uh, but millions of kids across the country are learning uh, in totally new ways, in hybrid or fully remote settings. So although necessary for the health and safety of all, this transition has exacerbated inequities across our education system for many students, particularly those who have access to the equipment or the technology necessary to complete their studies. And as you uh, already mentioned, early reports show that Black and Hispanic students are those who attend underserved schools disproportionately have showed declines in math and reading levels. And Congress has the opportunity to pass legislation, uh, making major investments in our nation's broadband access uh, with the Moving Forward Act, the HEROES Act to provide relief to our states and our local school districts to help address those inequities. So as a member of the House Education Labor Committee, I hold the unique position where I can actively voice my support for those measures, um, measures that will create a more equitable public education system for all of us. And I look forward to continuing that work and uh, participating in this important panel. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Representative. Um, for the first question, uh, what would you say are the biggest challenges Latino children are facing in K through 12? Uh, so as I, you know, as I mentioned, millions of kids across the country lack internet access at home. Uh, they're at great risk at falling behind in learning uh, during this pandemic. You know, we call, we've called it the homework gap, uh, and it is affecting both Black and Hispanic students from underserved schools at disproportionate rates. Our public education system is already unequal in many ways, and the pandemic has only exacerbated these inequities. You know, it's been months since the House passed the HEROES Act, and that legislation builds on the advancement uh, in, the, in the CARES Act uh, from this spring. It includes much needed and long overdue relief for working families and state and local governments and school districts. Uh, it included $90 billion in funding specifically allocated to support statewide and local funding for elementary, secondary, uh, public post-secondary schools to make them safe with upgrades to HVAC and ventilation systems and to fund the budgets that are experiencing dramatic shortfalls so that we're not cutting at a time when we need to be adding. Uh, Heroes also set aside $1.5 billion in funding to close the homework gap by providing funding for Wi-Fi, hotspots, Chromebooks, tablets for for all those households who need access. Uh, you know, in October, the House passed another version of HEROES Act, uh, we now call it HEROES 2.0, uh, that you know also included $12 billion in homework gap funding for those hotspots and those connected devices for our students. Uh, to say that we're frustrated that it's been sitting in the Senate without a vote is just an understatement. Uh, and you know, we're working uh, on a negotiation, but the reality is when we talk about building our country back better. Uh, we're talking about making sure that we're not going back to some old form of normal, uh, that we're, go we're actually making leaps and bounds in progress uh, in erasing these inequities in our school districts. But we do that through the budgets and the appropriations that we pass in the Congress. And that is, uh, that is something I champion on the com uh, Committee on Education and Labor, uh, because we're seeing it play out right now during these really difficult times. Great, thank you. It's great to hear the steps Congress is taking to address some of these inequities. Uh, and, and one last question for you. What, what digital strategies should kids and parents think about adopting during this time? 
Oh, well, I'm not sure I'm a role model uh, for what everybody should be doing. Uh, you know, there's no question that right now, uh, my kids are in front of a screen more than ever. They're fully remote. Uh, they're not in school at all. Uh, and, you know, we have to be really intentional about the breaks uh, that we take from technology because it is the form uh, of their learning. It's also the way that we can see their grandparents and their cousins and their friends, right? I mean, look, we're all playing uh, among us. <laughs> and that's not really uh, the answer is, you know, more screen time. So we have to be um, very intentional about going outside, about moving, uh, about doing things together, board games, puzzles, you name it. Uh, but I do think that we have to show our kids how to be present uh, for, you know, an in-person conversation or an in-person activity and, and really show uh, that even though during this time we are often sitting in front of a, a computer and, you know, like me, I'm telling them to hush uh, because, you know, we're all being... Uh, uh, incredibly mindful that we've all made this migration. We also have to hold up uh, the uh, the activities and the things that you know can sometimes fall by the wayside uh, because we are so focused on our our learning and our our meeting up with our friends and family. So uh, it's it's been a um, it's been a struggle I think for everyone. Uh, but I think the most important thing is that you inject uh you know the the normal things that we've always uh done but maybe have taken for granted into our daily routines well thank you very much for those insights we can certainly uh relate to some of those challenges and uh next up is noel candelaria uh welcome and could you uh tell us a little bit about what brings you to this issue sure thank you uh, james manuela <clears throat> i am noel candelaria i'm a high school special education teacher uh, from El Paso, Texas, and serving as the uh, newly elected Secretary Treasurer of the, the National Education Association. We represent 3 million educators uh, from all across the country, um, you know, just about every community in, in, this, in this great nation. Uh, and, you know, for us, this issue of systemic inequities and systemic racism, um, we, we've known that it's existed uh, long before this pandemic. Um, and this pandemic for us is just kind of you know, unmask the inequities that we knew already existed, but are now in every, you know, living room, in every bedroom, in every home, you know, across the country. Um, when we're, we are now bringing, you know, what, what was traditionally, you know, the brick and mortar school where we provided, you know, as much as we could for all of our students to diminish all of those inequities. And now this pandemic has exacerbated and now pushed those inequities directly into um, the homes of our students and, and our educators. And we have seen directly the lack of resources, um, not just, you know, with technology, um, but just the lack of resources in general um, that, that our communities, uh, especially our communities of color, indigenous communities and Hispanic and, and, and black communities, um, and how that's impacted um, them directly during this pandemic. And, you know, it's, it's a struggling issue that does the National Education Association, working with our state and local affiliates, um, have been working on uh, for years, um, you know, to try to, to diminish and, and close uh, these gaps that we have known long existed um, that now are front and center um, in front of all of us, um, especially as, as, you know, we have moved a lot of our classrooms into a remote setting uh, where a lot of our students didn't even have the basics, you know, pencil, paper, crayons uh, to complete some of these assignments, uh, let alone the technology needed to adequately connect um, with their peers and their teachers and learning outside of, of the traditional environment. There really are so many challenges facing students today. And and I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, some of the challenges uh, students are facing uh, right now regarding digital health and hygiene uh, during this pandemic. I mean, I think, you know, when, when we think about, you know, the inequities and, you know, we think about how quickly a lot of our districts with very limited resources, you know, back in March, right, when, when we transitioned to, to remote classrooms um, and quickly realized how many students did not have the technology, did not have the access to connect and have adequate bandwidth, because you have families that have multiple students, you know, all within uh, one household trying to connect at the same time and the, you know, the issues of bandwidth. And, you know, while our districts, a lot of our districts, you know, did tremendous work in trying to, you know, send, for example, uh, mobile hotspots using buses uh, to, to, to provide mobile hotspots in the communities, in apartment complexes, and in, in, in wherever our students were to try to bring that connection to them because of the lack of infrastructure. Um, you know, we also saw that, you know, the students who, who were now having to 
you know, weather the elements. Um, in the summer, you know, late summer, it, it was the heat. Now we're getting ready to enter, um, you know, the, 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 the coldest part of the, of the season. And so, you know, trying to weather these elements and, you know, the, 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 when we think about inequities and the fact that it was still, you know, too many of our students um, have to rely on those outside, you know, sources and are going to have to weather storms and don't have access to the Internet, um, you know, when it's most convenient to them. You know, for their learning style, for their learning style, and so you know, we are not only looking at connectivity issues, access to to technology, um, you know, but we are also looking at um, you know, right now, you know, the, the what's happening with schools opening and closing and sending students back and forth, and, and the social emotional impact um, that that this has had on our students, which is why you know, as the National Education Association, you know, we've been we've been you know very very adamant about you know making sure that that we want to open our schools when it's safe. Right, and that requires having the resources, like like Rep Representative Trahan said. You know, we that Heroes 2.0 Act not only provides our districts um, with the 12 billion dollars uh, that that we know is needed to to build out infrastructure through the E-rate program that districts know that that schools utilize. Um, that is a safe, you know, program that can that can quickly scale up. But we're not only looking at you know the short term; we're looking at the long term needs of what our students uh, are going to need, you know, post this pandemic. I mean, there there are so many you know inequities that we have that, that we have you know found right now. Um, but you know, having access to to teachers, I mean, we are losing record numbers of numbers of teachers, um, you know, at this moment, uh, you know, who who not only have lost their lives or educators, um, but are are because there is no clear plan on reopening um, or or their. Or, making sure that they have the proper uh, personal protection equipment, everything that's needed to safely reopen a school are choosing to opt out of the profession, right? So we, we are going to see not just short-term, but long-term impacts um, and long-term investment that we are going to have to uh, to invest in in our public school system uh, to, to make up for this one year because research has shown that it takes three years just to close that one year of, of inequities for a student. So, you know, we, we, are, we, we are looking at not just the, the needs that our students need in hardware, software, you know, making sure that we have the most experienced teachers in every community. Um, you know, we have students who prior to this pandemic didn't have access to a public library in their community. The only public library was their school and that's been closed. And, and so, so, you know, we are looking at all of these inequities um, and, and the investments that we have to do uh, to invest in, in our public school system, in our infrastructure, in, in the, the people that, that work in our public schools uh, moving forward. And to address these challenges, um, could you speak to any solutions uh, that could be considered specifically uh, when we're thinking about digital health and monitoring? Uh, does the NEA have any policy recommendations? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, 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 right now what we are really focused on, like uh, Representative Sharon said, is the, uh, the, the, the HEROES Act 2.0. I mean, the original HEROES Act was going to provide $175 billion to our public school system, right? Uh, you know, not just on, on funding for for, uh, for infrastructure, but but on the people that are needed, you know, to adequately make sure that all of our students have um, the uh, you know, uh, the uh, right now when, when we're looking about you know some of the solutions. If you go to uh, to our NEA.org website, um, you know we have tons of resources, not just for parents and educators, but for for, for our students um, on how to be able to adequately navigate, uh, you know, the the uh, the, the, the the challenges of of, uh, of of being able to meet the needs of all of our students. Um, we have students in special education who currently don't have access to their public school, right? And that requires federal investment uh, to make sure that that we have the adequate number of, of teachers that, that we have the the you know the, the buses you know to be able to transport them to and from um, in a, in the in the, the most safest responsible way. Uh, you know, for every single one of our students. And so, you know, making sure that, that all of our communities have the resources that they need is it's critically important, um, especially in our black, brown and, and indigenous communities who have historically been underfunded. And so, you know, when we're looking at um, how do we close this gap, right? How do we look at investing um, in, in, in the infrastructure that, that we know is, is there and, and, and looking at, at, uh, at making sure that every student has access to that quality educator that is going to connect with them, not just digitally, um, you know, but when we're able to reopen safely, um, is going to be really important. And, and that's why, you know, we're, we're calling on everyone to, to contact their, their senator, 
uh, because you know resources are going to be critically important for our school districts to have what they need um, in order to to not only reopen safely uh, but meet the needs of our students today and moving forward over the next you know uh, over the next several years. Well, thank you so much for highlighting some of the challenges, the many challenges and disparities that so many of our students face. Uh, next up is Stephen Balcom. And uh, uh, Mr. Balcom, could you explain a little bit about uh, what brings you to this issue? Uh, well, thank you very much, Jens, and thank you also to CHCI for the kind invitation to be with you all today. Um, so I am the founder and CEO of the Family Online Safety Institute. We're an international nonprofit whose mission is to make the online world safer for kids and their families. Uh, we operate in what we call the three P's of policy, practices, and parenting. So we pay a lot of attention to the public policies that uh, get generated by um, our friends on Capitol Hill. Uh, we track the FTC, FCC, the White House, etc. Uh, but we also keep an eye on what's going on in London and Brussels and Sydney because this is a global environment in which we and our kids are operating in. Uh, we conduct our own research. In fact, we just published some research into parental attitudes and teens' attitudes towards parental controls and online safety tools at our annual conference a couple of weeks ago, which I'd love to talk about. Um, our second P is industry best practices. So we are a membership organization. We have companies from Apple to Yahoo in the alphabet, if you will. Um, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and we work behind the scenes with them to up their trust and safety practices. And finally, we have a project called Good Digital Parenting. And the idea behind that is to um, empower parents to confidently navigate the web with their kids. Notice I use the word confidence. We don't use scary language. We don't try and create fear or whatever. We give them something called the seven steps to good digital parenting, as well as online safety contracts and tips and tools and resources, and in English and in Spanish, uh, to help them gear themselves up for the very difficult job of parenting in this digital age. And are there any additional details you'd like to share about how parents can confidently navigate the web uh, with their kids? Well, first of all, take a very deep breath. Um, you're not going to get 100% right. It would be pretty good if you got it 51% of the, <laughs> of the time right. Um, you know, this we've already heard uh, folks refer to green time, and this is a big issue uh, for kids, and it's a big issue for us adults as well. Um, one thing I would like to do, though, is to suggest that this is a broader issue and that there's a difference between screen time and screen use. I mean, if your child is on their phone or on their laptop um, talking to their grandparents uh, for a three quarters of an hour call, that is a fantastic use of their screen. If all they're doing is mindlessly watching video after video, um, that is probably not such a great use of their screen time. So let's make sure we can separate those two out. The other thing I would say um, and something we challenge parents when we talk to them at PTA meetings and community centers is to be a good digital role model yourself. Show your kids how you can put your phone down at dinner time, how you can uh, give them that one-to-one -one attention that they crave. The number one complaint we get from kids is, is that they can't get their parents' attention because they're always on their phone or dad's always just checking his email. So let's make sure, uh, as Representative Trayan said, make sure they get the board games out, make sure you go outside uh, and give them that kind of attention that they so much want. Thank you, yeah. And, and you had earlier mentioned you recently released a, a report a couple of weeks ago looking at, uh, I think it was parental controls and online safety tools. Uh, safety mm -hmm. tools. Uh, could you tell us a little yeah. more about that? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We found some generational differences. Um, we found that boomer parents uh, were more concerned with external threats like predators, whereas millennials were far more concerned about behavioral issues like cyberbullying and sexting. 
And they were also concerned that their kids might be the ones who are acting out on one. Um, we also found a big generational difference in terms of who is responsible for keeping kids safe. Twice as many boomers than millennials said that parents were responsible. Millennials thought that industry, government, others also played a role uh, in this overall environment. And I, I would agree. I, I think that um, industry really must step up to provide better tools, easier to find, easier to use. But one thing we also found out was that um, when we talk to teenagers about parental controls, they absolutely despise them. They hate them. They, they just think it's con literally controlling their behavior. But if you talk to them about online safety tools, the privacy settings, the alerts that they get, the ways in which they can block people, um, they love those because it empowers them. It gives them agency. So I think it's just a different way to think about this. And as, particularly as our kids get older, we move them from the more restrictive parental controls into the teen years. We should sit down with them and say, okay, show me how you can keep that Facebook post private. Show me how you can report this bad behavior on TikTok. And we parents might learn a thing or two as well. Yeah, those are some uh, really interesting generational differences. Uh, and you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, and, and next up is uh, Allison Vent. Uh, could, you, could you tell us a little bit about, and um, Representative Trahan, if you need to uh, leave where, I know we're approaching the 1 p.m. hour. Uh, uh, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, thanks so much. And uh, Allison, uh, Allison Vent, could you tell us a little bit about what brings you to this issue? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having uh, me here and uh, for having Dropbox here. Uh, so just to kind of, um, you know, talk a bit about what brings this issue, it's important to just, I think, give a quick overview of what Dropbox does as a company. So we're really focused on cloud storage and collaboration, and it's all about um, helping um, users uh, keep their life organized and flowing. And our mission as a company is, um, you know, to create a more enlightened way of work. And we're really focused on helping people be organized, stay focused, and really get in sync um, with our teams, with, yeah, even families and, and things like that. Um, I think what brings us uh, or brings me to this issue is um, we actually recently announced Dropbox's long-term remote work strategy, which we're calling Virtual First. And it's really focused on giving employees more flexibility about uh, where they get their individual work done. Um, it means that remote work is actually going to be the primary experience of all um, employees at Dropbox. Um, just to be clear, this doesn't mean we're abandoning um, in-office uh, work altogether, we're actually going to continue to facilitate in-person team gathering and collaboration and what we're calling uh, Dropbox Studios. And uh, prior to um, COVID-19 and the pandemic, as a company and many other companies were already considering what the future of work would look like, um, because there's just been an increasing desire um, from employees for more flexibility. Um, but certainly the pandemic really accelerated the conversation around what the future of work would look like. Um, our aim with this virtual first strategy is really to break away from the notion of a traditional work day. We have a few practices we're gonna be putting into place next year, um, like core collaboration hours and um, utilizing nonlinear work days to allow our employees to really work around a schedule that works for them. Thank you, that's, that's fascinating. I, I know, especially for people who are lucky enough to be able to work remotely, it seems like there are some, some big changes coming up in the future of work. Uh, what, and what are some of the best business practices um, that you could talk about, like advanced software updates, uh, password management, uh, things that people can, tools people can use to maintain a safe and secure uh, online uh, life. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a couple of different um, things that we're certainly considering with um, the move to virtual first. So privacy and security is something that is really top of mind for us as a, as a company. Um, and then certainly as we kind of move into um, 
uh, you know, primary sort of remote work uh, moving forward for us as well. Um, there are a number of uh, different kinds of tools um, that we use in terms of um, kind of overall security, um, whether it's things like Okta, for example, or we use um, 1Password, for example, to keep everything really secure. Uh, though moving forward, um, you know, we're, we're also going to be really focused on um, different kinds of collaborative um, kinds of software, whether it's um, you know, virtual whiteboarding and things of, of that nature too. So um, yeah, so there's just a lot that we're really considering. But again, privacy and security is something that's really important for us, um, whether it's uh, for folks that are, you know, working at home or that might be working in more collaborative spaces moving forward too. So it's definitely something that's really top of mind. Okay. And, and just more broadly speaking, are there any other uh, topics or themes you wanted to be sure to touch on? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, just the overall uh, kind of uh, concept of digital health is something that's really important to us from an employee perspective. And, uh, you know, again, we saw this sort of trend towards remote work uh, start well before the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and just as a whole, in terms of um, promoting digital health among our employees, there's a number of different things that we instituted. Um, so I know uh, there's been a lot of folks on this panel that have talked about sort of the challenges that that our parents face and children face. And that's something that we're really focused on a Dropbox. We um, have a number of um, parental benefits that we've put in place to support um, our employees in this, whether it's um, allowance for things like caregiver support or educational support, um, mental health support as well. Um, again, we talked about sort of this notion of collaboration numbers, which is really around um, a specific um, set period of time on um, sort of each day to focus on core collaboration. And this does not mean that um, folks are in kind of back-to-back -back Zoom meetings, which again, we know is contributing to sort of this exhaustion, this digital exhaustion. Um, and, but it does mean that, um, you know, we're really focused on when does it make sense for employees to um, kind of synchronously collaborate? Uh, and so um, it's really about employees kind of becoming um, more intentional about when do you need to be available from a synchronous perspective, and then when can you actually do work asynchronously too, um, which is really, really important. Um, this notion also leads, I, I talked a bit about this before, nonlinear work days, which is, uh, again, kind of breaking away from a lot of these traditional norms as it relates to work, which uh, typically folks have, um, you know, kind of worked this nine to five schedule. With core collaboration hours, we're giving more flexibility to employees um, to um, actually work in the evenings or early in the morning, kind of what works best for um, their schedule uh, and, and their preferences. Um, a couple of other things that we do to really promote kind of digital health and good digital hygiene too is uh, we instituted a program called Unplugged um, Personal Time Off, which is basically an opt-in program that allows you to really just disconnect from everything digital while you're on um, vacation. And then we've also done a number of kind of um, company-wide um, uh, time off days. In, in fact, um, over in um, Thanksgiving week, we did a gratitude week where the entire company took the week off. Uh, just again, promoting, um, I think, overall wellness and um, uh, good work-life balance for our employees. Well, thank you for offering a, a glimpse into some of the digital tools available and some, some changes that uh, look like they're coming up and for the future of work. Uh, and next up, uh, Annie Chavez, thank you very much for being here. And could you tell us a little bit about what brings you to this issue? Yeah, so on a personal level, this in my interest started in my first career, which is a middle and high school teacher. Uh, at the time, trying to figure out how do you engage, are there tools available to engage students and how to best use those tools. I later went to work in the US Senate, focusing on tech and telecom policy there. And, have now, and I'm now here at the Entertainment Software Association. ESA is the trade association for video game creators. So we represent companies from as small as one game to multinational corporations um, in their work on the gaming side. So that's how we get to where we are now. As we know, uh, gaming is becoming a larger part of our entertainment landscape, as well as our education landscape. We see gaming um, expanding its reach, especially in the current situation where gaming is in many places, the venue which 
now a lot of social interaction um, is taking place. I know for my 12 year old nephew, he and his classmates have a Friday, Friday game time regularly scheduled that they never miss. Uh, and that's when they, it's kind of almost takes place of the playground time that they used to have where they can just be themselves. And uh, it's a lot of fun to overhear him, <laughs> him on that. So we know that gaming is, is becoming an increasingly important part of that entertainment landscape. It offers the possibility of directly engaging with new characters, stories, um, storylines, as well as expanding your social network. You may um, initially start gaming just by yourself, but we often see um, those gamers tend to expand into larger or groups um, online that they enjoy. And so one of the big pieces of what we do here at ESA is ensuring that we're providing gamers and the parents and the adults and caregivers of gamers with the tools they need to ensure that they are, the gaming is age appropriate, that they have the tools to manage that time. As Stephen mentioned, you know, for many parents, it's a um, younger kid, do you wanna be limiting screen time? You wanna have the tools to be able to do that. Um, you wanna have, we also provide the, um, sort of framework of how you have conversations about your digital time, your online time, because it, it's an important part of a well-rounded lifestyle. And that includes getting up, getting out. We all know, as Allison mentioned, back-to-back uh, -back Zooms, I think everybody is realizing that you don't want to be in front of a screen all day long. It's important to get up, get out and enjoy nature. So how do parents um, and, and those gamers directly, how do they, take all that into consideration in order to ensure that they are living a well-rounded lifestyle in which gaming is a fun part of their life. You know, there's um, more than 15 years of studies about the effects of gaming and it's generally very positive. We see decreased depression, decreased sense of isolation around gaming, increased creativity, increased social connections, um, and so that's important, an important piece of what we do and what we try to ensure that we are pr providing that information out to gamers and the, like I say, the adults, the caregivers and the parents of gamers um, to create that, that healthy lifestyle. Yeah, it's fascinating to hear about the intersection of, of gaming and, and education and, and where those things overlap. I, I was wondering uh, if you could offer um, parents, especially any any tips, anything that they might uh, keep in mind as they're navigating uh, gaming with, with uh, everything else kids have going on in their lives? Yes, happy to. So uh, the first one I'd like to mention is parentaltools.org, all one word. Uh, that is a what part of the um, ESA's efforts to provide parents the information that they need and it uh, gives them an overview. The biggest piece is understanding, especially for the younger gamers, understanding the content and the games that your kids are, are playing. Engage your kids in those conversations. Sit and watch. If you want to play the game with them, that's awesome. But if it's something where you just spend a few minutes looking over their shoulder, as I mentioned, my 12 year old nephew, that was kind of my, you know, just happened to be be at the house and just sitting over kind of watching the game as he was interacting with that. Those conversations are critical for parents to have with their kids. We can provide the tools, game makers provide tools, console makers provide tools to limit time, to limit what kind of communication can be had within the game, to uh, limit in-game purchases or other things, but the real tool that you're gonna give your kids for now and for the rest of their lives is how do they think about their interaction with gaming? Where What's enough for you? What kind of games do you want? Do you know, just like we do with kids every day in the real world, online safety? How do you have those conversations with kids? And those conversations need to continue throughout the life the life of your kids in your home. And uh, like I say, even adults need to be thinking about those things for themselves. What, what kind of relationship do you wanna have with the gaming? Because again, uh, Stephen referred to, I think it's important to think of um, not just screen time, but what kind of interactions are you having with the screen? We find that in gaming, there's a lot of education that goes on, whether it's an intentionally educationally directed game or another kind of game in which you're learning more about like 
cooperation, strategy, planning, thinking ahead, that those sort of things that kids learn just through playing a game without it being, it being intentional. So for parents, those conversations are essential to have. Again, game um, developers provide them a lot of tools. The console makers provide them tools to limit screen time, like I say, and to, to um, ensure that games are age appropriate. Another important tool that we provide through the Entertainment Software Re um, Ratings Board, ESRB, is we rate games. And this is something that 88% of adults are aware of the video game rating, process, rating content. So there's four levels of ratings. And within that, we also provide content descriptors so that you can know before you purchase a game, is there um, communication with others? Is there violence? Anything along the lines of a movie rating, but also, you know, highlighting um, age appropriate games for parents. So that is another tool that parents can have. If you go to esrb.org, you can look up any game and find out what the rating is. That's also available on any package that you get. Anytime you purchase a game, before you purchase it, you will be given that information about the what the rating is for that game. So another critical tool for parents is to ensure that the gaming content their kids are involved in or the youngins that they're responsible for is age appropriate. Well, thank you so much for your insights and, and certainly have given parents a lot of tools that, that they can add to their to their <clears throat> toolkit as, as they navigate the, this world of gaming uh, um, at home. And, that, and thanks to all the panelists as well for your comments and insights. Uh, next, we'll uh, transition into the Q&A and we we do have a number of uh, a number of questions to dive into. So let's let's get started. Um, the one question here, the first question is: How can you be an active parent and still respect your children's privacy? Is checking their social media accounts regularly a healthy behavior? Uh, and is there anyone in particular who would like to uh, answer this one? I'm happy to start with that. I mean, first of all, um, you know, most parents um, are probably not aware of the age 13 and how important that is. That is typically the age in which a child or a teenager can join social media. Um, it's linked to the COPPA, the Child Online Privacy Protection Act. Um, but irregardless, um, what we said to our daughter and uh, what I recommend parents say to their kids is, Yes, you can have a Facebook, Twitter, YouTube account, whatever, uh, at, a, at whatever age they think is appropriate, but not before 13. And I will be your first friend. I will be your first follower. Um, now, that's not to say that as parents, we should overdo things. We shouldn't stalk them. We shouldn't comment on every posting that they do. But just know, just from time to time, check in to see uh, what they're doing. I also think at the in the early teen years, um, and certainly preteen, it's very appropriate for parents to have passwords to your the various accounts that your kids have. Now, as a teen gets older, and we, we like to say the training wheels start to come off, um, then I think that certainly when they're getting to 16, 17, and definitely 18, they have far more, as it were, privacy rights. Uh, and I think we should respect those rights. Uh, and so, yeah, get involved in your kids' online lives. Play the games that uh, Annie's been describing. Um, they absolutely love to share their online life with you, and it, particularly if you show an interest. Yeah, that, that's so interesting to hear that, that perspective, that kids want to share uh, their, their lives with, with the parents. Um, and kind of along these lines, I uh, might, might as well ask a related question here. Um, and I think this is probably a question a lot of parents have. Uh, when, when should children get phones? At what age, and related to that, at what age do you recommend children uh, get their first social media accounts? How young is too young? And uh, Stephen, it, it, I don't know if there's anything you could add to that. <laughs> well, okay, that's pretty much the number one question we can ask. What age should I get my kid a phone? Um, when I first started this, it was what age should I get my high schooler a phone? Then it became middle schoolers. And now we're seeing kindergartners showing up with uh, dad's old iPhone. 
Um, we don't really think it's appropriate for kindergartners or even for that matter, elementary school kids to have these highly sophisticated mini computers in their backpacks. Um, there's quite a number of new digital devices like the Gizmo watch that allows for some very limited texting and phoning and a GPS tracker for the younger, younger set. You know, roughly we're seeing that somewhere in the middle school years is where most kids are getting their first phone. But again, it doesn't have to be the end smartphone. Um, you can get them uh, sort of what my daughter used to describe as dumb phones uh, for, for the younger set. Um, so, but when you, whatever device it is that you are going to give to your child, make sure that you have, as uh, Annie was describing, have that conversation with them. And maybe that would be a good moment also to set some ground rules uh, that you agree with your children about their use. Do things like create a, a closet in the house or the apartment that you're in where everyone, including mom and dad, charges their devices overnight. So there's the, te the temptation to take them to bed isn't there. Okay. Now, if I could, and, I could add, uh, Jens, real quick, as a, from, from an yeah, education perspective, um, there there are a lot of a lot of schools, and I think it's really important for parents to 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 work closely with their schools and their teachers and know what the policies are um, around phones, um, you know, in the school. Um, but because I mean, there are some there are a lot of teachers that have been, I think, you know, when a large percentage or, or the majority of your kids in your in your homes um, that have phones, you know, they have found creative ways to utilize, um, you know, that technology within the classroom or within home, you know, for, you know, to create different types of, of games of interaction, um, you know, which is important, but it's really important for parents to know, um, you know, what are the policies within my campus, where my, my child attends or the district um, when it comes to phone use in the school, um, you know, so that, you know, they don't get a phone and then they come home and they say, well, now I've got to uh, pay a fine or, you know, pick up the, the phone. Um, it's really important to understand what the parameters are because um, the last thing you want is for your child to get a phone, get all excited, go to, and all of a sudden it gets picked up because it was not used appropriately um, within the school setting, within the confines of what those policies are within the school. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really important. Um, and uh, anyone else want to say anything on that? Otherwise, I have another uh, question. And... Um, that shifts the gears from uh, uh, kids to adults and the workplace. And I, this might be something that either Annie or Allison might be able to speak to. Um, this question is, uh, gaming has become an effective training tool for many organizations uh, in motivating their employees. Uh, has anyone used gaming as a learning tool in their work environment? Uh, Allison, is I, anything you might be able to speak to? I can answer this. Um, so we have used kind of the concept around gamification, if that makes sense, for um, as a learning tool. Um, it's something I would say particular teams and organizations within Dropbox may use um, more than other teams. For example, like our sales team will use concepts of gamification um, inside um, some of their training. Um, it seems to to fit well with sort of some of the uh, 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 goals, I would say, of the organization just overall. Um, but it's something that our learning and organizational development team is is kind of always considering, especially again, you know, I mentioned we're going fully remote um, moving forward with some exceptions, but that means all of our training needs to, it will also be primarily remote. There will be, again, some exceptions to that. Um, so. It can be a challenge, definitely, to make virtual training um, engaging, and it's something that our, our teams are always considering, and and kind of gamifying um, that training is something that um, can lead to, I think, uh, extra engagement, but we just want to be really thoughtful about what we're doing. So again, I would say right now, we're kind of just piloting it um, with specific teams inside of our organization, but it's likely something that will, will continue to kind of... Um, potentially become more a part of, of kind of broader training that we're doing, because it can be a really effective tool, especially in terms of retention, too. Okay. Um, Andy, or anyone else want, want to add to that? Yeah, I'll just add, it is something that we um, see increasing interest in. I would agree with Allison, though, for most places that are trying to incorporate it, it's still at a very early level. It's not something that's widespread. 
um, the use of video games in training, not only in the workplace, but we see it, like I mentioned earlier, in education. Um, education is much is more advanced than the workplace gaming is. And so hopefully that is something we see come in the future that, you know, this technology is always moving and um, we know there's a market there uh, on the on the workforce training side and it it's just a matter of finding out the best use for it. We don't just want to throw throw it out there just because it's a possibility. Really want to make sure that it's um, that it's useful. Yeah, and um, I think we probably have enough time for one more uh, quick question. And here here's an interesting one. Um, and it looks like this is probably for for Annie. Um, how can we use games to better teach kids about things like the pandemic um, and uh, this person mentions that World of Warcraft had a, as an example, World of Warcraft had a pandemic once several years ago, which I actually think I might have heard about that on, on a podcast this spring. Uh, but is there anything you could talk uh, talk to uh, on this topic, Annie? So there are a lot of, uh, I won't say a lot, there are several um, games that actually use that if for uh, some of the old, older folks on, <laughs> on they may, may remember Oregon Trail where the pandemic and, and um, famine was a, actually a piece of that game. So if you want to be specific about it like that, there are games that um, mostly in other worlds, sort of when you're creating your own world, is this a possibility? Not, necess not necessarily pandemic as much as um, famine and that sort of thing, but there are those out there. There's also, um, if you're looking, what we have seen is, we have a, a game right now with a game within a game that is mapping the human genome. So what I would really encourage people is if you have this interest, there is probably something out there. Take some time. And this is another place where you can engage your kids. If that is, you know, if that's younger kids or teenage kids, even better, maybe middle school, high school age is as a family, let's investigate this. Let's go find this game. If this is an area that we're interested in, let's uh, let's find out if there's a, a game that we can be playing as a as a game as a family. It can maybe a team. Is it maybe an interactive thing that we can engage with other folks on? Uh, and that's a real opportunity mm -hmm. on any area, not just on the pandemic. And th there are, like I said, keep an eye out. There are some games that are um, looking at how they can use the game to teach. How, how you come out of and you know what what's on the others what does it look like on the other side what might some changes be in the way that we conduct day-to-day -day life just on the sort of um, hygienic level sort of thing so it's a good opportunity for families like I say to engage in those conversations once again and do a little research and have some fun with it because there's opportunities out there yeah yeah well, thank you, Annie, and uh, thank you, panelists, for answering some of the questions, and thank you to the audience for, for your great questions. Uh, next, I'd like to wrap things up, and to do that, I'd like to ask each panelist to share a final thought that they'd like to leave the audience with. Um, and if you could please keep this to uh, no more than one, one to two minutes uh, per person. Um, and let's start uh, with Noel. Right. Thank you, Jens Manuel, and thank uh, CHCI for, for the opportunity uh, to, to have this important conversation and how important it is for, for parents and educators and the community at large and the business community to, to have these conversations about you know, the, the resources that are truly needed right now um, in our communities, especially our Hispanic communities, our communities of color, um, to be able to connect every single student. Um, you know, one of the cruelest parts of this whole digital divide is that we still have millions of students um, across our entire K-12 system in higher education who are still not connected as we speak right now. Um, you know, and how important it is for us to, you know, to, 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 to contact your members of Congress um, and contact your state legislatures as they get ready to go into their legislative sessions uh, to provide these, these desperately needed resources for our public schools. Um, you know, you can go to educatingthroughcrisis.org, which is a site that we created through NEA uh, specifically to help parents navigate and students navigate, um, you know what what it, you know what is it that we need to know right now to help our support our students, help support our educators, um, because this is something that is impacting every single one of us and the future of, of, of our nation and 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 what the, being able to close these gaps is going to be critical that we address them today and in the the days to come and in the years to come to make sure that all of our students truly have that access to a quality public education that they all deserve. So thank you for having me here today. Thank you. 
And uh, next up, Stephen, could you offer some final thoughts? Uh, well, let me also offer my thanks, Jens, and to CHCI for, for having me and my organization represented today. Um, absolutely, I would have to uh, echo what Noel just said. I mean, it's so critical that we get people connected um, first and foremost. As more people get connected, though, we also must make sure to educate folks as to the healthy use, a uh, healthy diet, if we will, um, to uh, learn how to create a balance in their own and their children's online lives. Um, I would urge you to go to fosi.org, F-O-S-I dot O-R-G, and download in English or in Spanish our Seven Steps to Good Digital Parenting. Uh, number one, I would say is, and the most important parental control that exists is to talk with your kids. Talk with them early, talk with them often, stay engaged. Um, use the parental controls for the younger kids. Talk about online safety tools as they become teens. And our last uh, step is to be a good digital role model yourself. Um, don't use your phone as an alarm clock, because guess what? That's the last thing you'll look at before you go to sleep. And before you even get out of bed in the morning, you might be there texting and, uh, and checking your email. Your kids will watch. They'll do what you do rather than what you tell them to do. So uh, make sure that you can show them how to create uh, that balance in their lives. Um, with that, again, thank you so much for having us be a part of this very important discussion. Thank you. Uh, and uh, next up, Allison, could you offer some final thoughts? Yeah, and just to, again, echo, thank you so much for having me here. Um, and I also, just to kind of build off of what both Noel and Steven said, I think um, that ba balance and sort of um, wellness overall is going to be something that's increasingly important. I, I briefly touched on this before, but, you know, I think this is our new normal, um, even as hopefully the, the conditions, you know, from the pandemic continue to improve um, and lots of folks may be going back into the office, but it's likely that more flexibility um, and remote work, is, it's it's really kind of here to stay in some capacity. And so um, just would plug just, um, you know, really being thoughtful around um, how you can create well-being um, for yourself in, in terms of this, what this new kind of work environment looks like as well. Um, I would also suggest just for some, I, I think, great tips in terms of how to maintain that um, work-life balance in, in a digital, um, you know, world. And as we move towards more and more remote work to actually um, check out our Dropbox blog, which is blog.dropbox.com. And we have um, what we call our virtual first toolkit on there with lots of practices around um, not only how to kind of create the optimal home office space for yourself, but how to think about um, creating those boundaries and, and, um, and, and really to promote that, that work-life balance for yourself in this increasingly remote um, world. So just would invite all of you to check it out. It's an open resource for any of you. So feel free um, to take in whatever capacity might make sense for you, um, even for your families or you know the organizations you're a part of. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Andy, if you could offer some final thoughts. Um, I echo everyone else. Thank you to CHCI. This was, I think, a really important forum and important conversation to have. Uh, Parting thoughts would be, again, have for parents, know what resources are at your fingertips. Uh, look at uh, esrb.org, parentalcontrols.org to find out those resources. And importantly, have these conversations with your kids, have them and your your loved ones around your family table, have them not just once, not just twice, but keep going back to this. Make the discussion around digital health and creating a well-rounded, healthy environment that utilizes the available technology, a part of that everyday conversation. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I've, it's, all of you have certainly given me a lot, a lot to think about, and I'm sure a lot uh, for our audience to think about. And, and thanks again.